Hello, everyone. Uh, good day, good evening, and uh, good morning from wherever you are tuning in. Uh, I know we have representation from around the world, so definitely going to be uh, different parts of the world at different times of the day. I am Valmiki Mukherjee. I'm the chairman and founder of Cyber Future Foundation. Um, as many of the uh, uh, community members know, we are uh, focused on leadership development and leadership males teaming and team means talent. And with all that, uh, you know, attention uh, to growing this practice and profession of cybersecurity, we have a very dedicated program that uh, talks about and works on the field of cyber security career and talent and workforce development. For the last uh, almost coming out of 10th year, Cyber Future Foundation community has been focusing on identifying areas where we need uh, cybersecurity talent, not just the signy ones and the ones that you see on the top of the list. Um, uh, but we do, uh, you know, operate across multiple functional areas of cybersecurity, and we we try to see how much we can, you know, shore up those practices. Uh, each of us are practitioners and professionals in this area. Uh, some have spent uh, decades in this area. Um, some have kind of find, found their way into cyber security. And uh, many, I, you know, fortunately are looking to come into this field. And that's where we're focused on. This particular workshop is coming out of um, almost two years of working in this field. The, uh, after the cyber talent workshop that we or Cyber Talent Week that we hosted two years back. Um, well, you know, if we were to get all gather all of those leaders back together, I think that would be a monumentous task that we pulled off during COVID. Um, but now everybody is back and busy, um, you know, hybrid, in person, uh, virtual, you name it, uh, and uh, pretty much working the same round the clock hours that we have been, uh, but you know, with some physical presence. So uh, we, we thought, you know, start, break this uh, agenda of about 20 odd topics into, uh, you know, two to three hour chunks that we can give the time for our practitioners and fellow community leaders to come in and talk about. Uh, you will see representation across this, uh, you know, live webinars uh, from different um, stages of practitioner and professional life. Uh, and also we'll bring in some of the candidates and their experience. Uh, unfortunately, you know, one of the candidates that were part of this initial um, working group uh, had to go for an interview. And and uh, so that that's a great thing. It's actually a progress in that space if you think about it. Um, so giving a little bit of uh, background on the Project Gateway. So Project Gateway is our focused uh, initiative around cybersecurity capacity building. Uh, we started this in 2018, 2019. It shaped into a proper program. Uh, as part of that, we uh, we hosted the Sci Jobs uh, initiatives, the Cyber Career and Apprenticeship Work uh, Program uh, that you know uh, initially supported the Department of Labor's initiatives in the U.S. And now uh, across the board, that that learning and uh, um, and the program experience has been shared across the board. Uh, uh, that led to the 2022 program uh, around Cyber Talent Week, where we invited pretty much every stakeholders in the cybersecurity career journey into having those discussions, which led to a white paper that we published. Uh, as many of you know, we don't do a lot of white papers, but some of the um, some of the programs really need things to be memorialized, right? So that that was one of the um, you know initiatives that we took to document the findings and. Uh, Last two years actually worked on them. Um, some of that went into how the careers um, of the current practitioners uh, is shaping up in terms of the growth in their professional development and going from you know, a few years in cybersecurity technology and programs to uh, going into more um, executive and leadership platforms as uh, you may be trending, um, you know, uh, tracking the trend already that many of the CISOs are actually taking on more business leadership roles, technology leadership roles. They're taking joint CIO CISO roles. So there has been a lot of that transition happening. And I think that calls, uh, I mean, that that uh, demonstrates the uh, a, a profession that's maturing and is contributing to the overall business and society. Uh, 
we also identified uh, you know a lot of um, cyber entry level um, candidates uh, who we have been tracking for the last two years and i think you know that's something that i would like to the, to draw the attention of the speakers here um, and also the broader community that many of them are actually become or have actually become a, a, a key part of the community and broadly not just cfa but broad community they find resources they share resources but a big challenge is um what are, what is it have you know was it what is it um you know benefiting them um you know as much time as they try to find resources for others are they able to actually grow their own skills and and be able to be gainfully employed uh, in this journey so that's a little bit controversial i think i have seen both sides i have had uh, in, uh, you know um, discussions with candidates uh, who feel that they are not being heard or they are not giving that not being given the chance whereas i've also talked to hiring managers and very senior leaders who are actually responsible for an accountable more than responsible is the accountability of the program to to deliver the cyber security and cyber risk management outcomes that they need and they think they don't see that the entry level people are ready for that they're they're investing their time attention energy into learning uh, as much as they're sharing so that's a very controversial topic and we definitely want to touch that we want to make sure that we uh, address some of these topics that are um, that need the attention and and that's why you know this particular roundtable is more about orienting the cyber candidates whether they're entry level and i think that's where we needs a lot of attention but also mid level and career transitioners who are getting a different signal from a bigger social media or their bigger community interaction versus their particular response from hiring process and the hiring managers and the folks who are actually needing their help. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Catherine to introduce uh, the rest of the panel uh, with you. And we'll, um, I'm looking forward to a very robust discussion about the different topics that uh, are attached to this particular uh, important cause. So uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, today and look forward to having a great discussion. So Catherine, over to you, please. Thank you, Val. And, and as Val mentioned, you know, this has been kind of um, a labor of love for our community and a priority for the last number of years. Um, and as Val mentioned, um, the Cyber Talent Week, which was a five day um, hybrid event, um, three days we devoted to um, topics and, and looked at, at the, the, the topic of cyber capacity building from a number of different lenses um, from both uh, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion to how do we make, you know, how do we help mentor and support folks that are coming into the, um, into the industry. So I'm really excited about this panel, uh, namely because everybody is actually at different stages of their career. Um, some of career transition, like myself, I came from the business process and outsourcing industry. Um, I became interested in, in cybersecurity about 13 years ago. Um, and it was, while it was challenging to get into the industry, once in the industry, I found it a very welcoming community. Um, I thought we would start off with Gordon, if you wouldn't mind kicking things off and, and giving our audience a little bit of introduction into your background. Sure. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Catherine and Val. Uh, I think this is an uh, unbelievable opportunity to spend an hour or so with um, some of um, uh, remarkable folks from from uh, various organizations and and um, share some of our experiences. So my background, I started in the IT industry in the late 70s. I know it seems like yesterday, but um, you know the world is has kind of gone full circle. Back then, it was data centers and service bureaus and and um, mainframes, and it seems like we've we've gone back to that. We've gone back to this world uh, where today we have the cloud and we have essentially um, mainframes serving up cloud services. Security has become um, a critical thing. Back in the old days, we didn't have to worry so much. But over the past several um, years, the companies that I work with, just to give you a, a, and some insight, um, Texas Instruments, AT&T, Compaq Computer Corporation, Hewlett Packard, and then I retired from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, before joining CompTIA, the Computing Technology Industry Association. Um, and throughout the, the past several years, security has become much more critical and much more important. 
I managed a small team at uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise that did um, security uh, testing, penetration testing, and um, and a number of those types of um, um, rudimentary um, security functions. But the the point is, you know, it's become more and more important as today as we look at it. It's one of the most important factors as we look at the the challenges in healthcare or, or infrastructure or operational technology or um, even just um, uh, fundamental infrastructure operation. Um, we see the challenge every single day where attacks are happening, um, you know, every few seconds uh, around the globe. Um, and um, so it's, it's really a um, uh, great opportunity for us to join you today and uh, to give back a little bit, talk, share some of our experience and some of our insights around the uh, uh, opportunities with cybersecurity. And Gordon, as you mentioned, your experiences both being a hiring manager and then working in the training industry, um, when we released the white paper report, uh, recommendation number three, when it was developing the necessary knowledge and skills. So throughout this discussion, I'm probably going to be leading some of that discussion back towards you. Um, Nadia, I wanted to uh, hand the mic over to you next, because again, um, introduced to, to our audience, your background, um, and both as a industry practitioner, subject matter expertise expert, and also a hiring manager. So if you want to give, uh, give our audience a little insight into your background and, and what the weather's like in South Africa right now, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Yes, usually we would say it's sunny South Africa, but unfortunately we're having a little bit of tough weather. So it's uh, dark and gloomy and rainy, but it's okay. We'll still take it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's evening here. Um, I'm I'm Nadia Viren Patel. I am. I've been in IT for probably just over 20 years. Um, went into it when it was a difficult, very male-dominated environment, and transitioned into security about nine years ago. Um, that was also an interesting transition. And I think you're right, Catherine, the security industry and everybody in this community is so welcoming, so open, um, and I love it. I just love the inclusion. Um, I've also recently started about a year and a half ago, a platform called Journeys to Inspire, because I'm really passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we do a lot of talks, uh, especially in schools, because we're trying to get more kids into the STEM industry. Um, I really, I, being a neurodiverse kid myself, um, I also want to aim and specifically talk to those kids because we were all geeks at school. We weren't cool. Um, but, you know, going to security and, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got the cool job. Um, so I love my job currently. It's it's not an easy one, but I hope that we can help some people today and make it a little bit easier. And I think being a person of color, as well as a female, I have a lot of experience to talk to about that. So I hope to share some of that knowledge today. And, and, so and that's awesome. And as we mentioned, that was um, the diversity, equity, inclusion perspective was shared from multiple standpoints, both um, uh, from DEI perspective, socioeconomic perspective, and we can dig a little in, more into that because recommendation number one um, out of the white paper was to foster a more broad and diverse um, cybersecurity community. So I'm really looking forward to some of your insights, Nadia, as we start to dig into it. Lynn, I'm going to uh, hand the the, um, the mic to you next. And as Lynn and I have been, Lynn and I were um, kind of had a business working relationship. Both were working outside of cybersecurity. Um, Lynn, maybe you can give your audience the audience a little bit of background because you're somewhat new. You're about probably what five years into the industry now. You're right, Catherine. Officially, I'm three. And um, you know, first first off, I'm I'm excited beyond excited to talk about cyber because I am a newbie to it, but I came intentionally, strategically, and well-informed to to this industry. And like you, Catherine, once I was in, I was welcome, but how'd I get in? So if you're joining us uh, either live or on the recording, wonderful, something has called you. 
to take a very serious look at this industry and for good reason. As Nadia said, it's having its moment. There aren't many times in our careers, in our lives, where we're gonna join an industry that's gonna shape the future of the world. This is a calling for me as much as it was the opportunity to get a job. So my journey here, my LinkedIn profile tells you enough about me. I don't need to rehash that. But what happened was during the pandemic, like a few, like a few other folks, some millions, I found myself in, in a transition and doing some real reflective work on what would be my next adventure. And because Catherine and I had stayed in touch over the years and I was hearing interesting things, the headlines around ransomware is usually how most of us neophytes might find our way to cyber. Uh, but I was talking to Catherine and, and it was the skills shortage. And so here's a myth that got busted for me and maybe I'm gonna help bust it today on this call. Um, myth was, well, I'm not a coder or a developer. There's no room for me at this table. I'm not gonna be invited to the party. And Catherine was like, not so fast. We need people in sales, sales enablement, marketing, HR, finance, et cetera, who are bringing this cyber desire, if you will, cyber passion into play. So I thought, well, maybe I should take a look at this. So what I hope to talk about today will be the fact that I brought a, say, a combined background of sales, VP corporate communications. So I am one of those career transition people that uh, was mentioned earlier. And I also brought into this a real desire to do something very meaningful with my life. Um, this is an industry like no other. And so if you're thinking about it, I encourage you to, to take notes, ask questions if we're, we're having a great Q&A afterwards. And, um, and then I, I hope to speak to some very specific action plans about how I prepared myself as a viable candidate for people who maybe in the past thought, oh, I don't know, I'm, I've never hired a marketing type person before. Because remember, this is an industry that's maturing. So a lot of times the job that's needed, the work that's needed, the outcome that's needed hasn't yet been defined. So in our conversations with potential hiring managers, we might actually be crafting the job that we both really need done, the work that needs to be done. And that was what I found very exciting in my conversations. The job that I eventually was hired for <laughs> didn't exist. It came about through an important conversation, an act of listening. So I'm really excited to be here and to talk um, to talk about that experience. Specifically in cyber, my role was sales, so revenue growth, and also training and upskilling the sellers so that they could be effective in their role as well with a, a global cyber security company. So sales, um, I can't, Catherine, you and I both have a sales background from, from years ago, B2B. And I will tell everyone in the world this, uh, irrespective of cyber, you got a paycheck and you're working for a for-profit business of any kind, you got that paycheck because somewhere down the line there was a customer. But in between that was someone called a seller who had to make real good sense of the technology or the offering or the service and help fill that difficult uh, need or, or solve that problem and create a solution. And cyber is an incredibly important sales profession right now. So I'm happy to talk to that. You're on mute, Catherine. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, sorry, Lynn, that was excellent because recommendation number two in the five part uh, program was to strengthen and the recruiting and employment best practices. Now, Leah, um, you know, you and I have worked together through CFF and outside of CFF for a number of years. You were intimately involved in um, Cyber Talent Week, and you were intimately involved in the work that was done uh, with the National Cybersecurity Apprenticeship pr Framework. So kind of uh, recommendations four and five, which really were around you, which was building cybersecurity career paths for and developing and putting those into organizations. And in addition to developing and embracing government initiatives, you've kind of lived it. So can you give the audience a background of your incredible career and some of the work that you've been doing? And then we're going to jump into it. Sure. Coming off mute here. Um, nice to meet everyone. And I'm glad you could join us. And thank you, Val and Catherine and um, all of these speakers for this session today. 
Um, my career was, uh, I've always been in tech, but I started in PR and marketing and more on the business side. And then that worked into product and strategic alliances. And I got into cybersecurity um, 10 plus years ago when I was at Cisco. And I've been both, you know, hiring manager, um, career transitioner, and my career was more like all over the place, right? In terms of just not a linear line. Um, but I, at some point it got to a place where it became very intentional to stay in cybersecurity, to really hone in on realizing what my skill sets were, um, a lot of self-teaching uh, myself and upskilling and trying to figure out how to blend my business and technical expertise together and figure out where to go next. Um, I wish that some of the things that were created today, especially through CFF and with the workforce um, initiatives, were available when I was younger in my career, but I'm glad that they are coming together today for the future generation. And so I do want to um, continue to give back and help mentor others and just be someone to talk to others in terms of how I did it and what's available from resources and um, the reality of getting in um, and things that you can do with all the incredible resources that are available out there to help you. And um, as everyone said, it's a welcoming community. And as long as we're all working together, I think we can make a lot more inroads in terms of making it a much easier pathway for folks to get in because we need you all. That's excellent. And an excellent foray into the kind of the first point, which is, first point of discussion, which is kind of current state of what we're gonna call this, the domain cybersecurity 101 as in terms of where things stand. And let me give you just a really quick um, perspective on it. So, so Cyber Future Foundation was founded in 2015 and we're gonna have our 10th anniversary next year. It was, for, it was established with one really key goal, which was to connect security leaders with the C-suite and the board. And many folks can maybe understand it, Gordon, you, you probably lived it. Um, because at that point in time, cybersecurity was not very well understood or, or, or discussed. Uh, in many cases, it was still looked as being a part of the overall IT function. Now, fast forward to today, and you're very hard pressed to say, see security leaders that are not in front of the C-suite on a board, if not on a daily basis, on a very regular basis. And because of that, at us as an organization, CFF is you know, going through what we're calling um, CFF 2.0, and we're doing workshops across the country and, and globally to better understand as we get to 10 years where we should be, because the, the industry is, is um, kind of, advance so much. So I want to start by getting each of your individual perspectives on what you think current state of the industry looks like. And we're going to kick this one off with Natty. I'm going to get your, because you're you're working both as an, uh, a security leader and an organizational leader. What are you seeing? So it's interesting, Catherine, because the company I actually work for now, we do talent management and talent advisory, right? So we look at a lot of companies, we're seeing a lot of the problems, we're seeing a lot of the issues. So I don't think there's really a lack of people. I think there's also a lack of jobs, to be honest. We aren't we aren't allowing a lot of entry-level positions to come into the, into the cyber realm. And I think that's where a lot of the issues stem from right now, is because we're all looking for that you know, that that mid management or the senior level management to come in, take over and do the job. But the problem is we're not we're not educating and we're not allowing the work experience to come from the bottom and build them up. And I think that's what we're having a lot of issues with right now, because there are cyber academies, there's leaderships, there's there's learnerships, there's a whole lot of things that's going on. And um, are we giving these guys the jobs? Are we giving those 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 guys and girls the jobs to be able to come in and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm basic here, but teach me what you know. And I think from my perspective, that's where I'm really seeing um, a lack of, of, of inclusion. And, and Lynn, from your perspective, because as you mentioned, you came from a, a large well-known mm -hmm. cybersecurity organization. And unfortunately, with, you know, restructuring, um, your role was, you know, eliminated at the beginning of this year. But what do you, what have you seen over the last three years since you came into cybersecurity? Where do you see the industry current state? Thank you. Uh, so what I've observed, and I'm glad that we are going to talk in that industry experience. 
So what's changed is pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, I think a lot of industries, including cyber, um, went into a kind of hyper hiring mode. Uh, they Because cyber in particular was, as we know, having its moment. Uh, the workforce was changing. Hybrid uh, suddenly put different pressures on the secure posture of organizations. And um, the work from anywhere environment drove that. So in, in terms of the kinds of recruitment that I'm seeing that's changed now, the HR role, because they're, in, they're part of this, right? They're experiencing some pressure, Catherine, in helping hiring managers reframe that shopping list. So it's it's uh, they don't have an easy job. So if anyone on this call is either in HR or knows someone, I hope you'll share this uh, this uh, discussion with them because we feel your pain. It's up to um, it, it's really going to challenge I think HR strategy to um, and I'll speak to cyber on two sides of the fence if, if it's okay, Catherine. On the one side, you have the companies that are producing the software or the solutions or or whatever, and included in that might be the partner channel. So you've got those folks, but then you also have companies and organizations and government who need to hire CISOs and need to hire that type of talent. And here's what I'm finding very interesting. From the top CISOs I've talked to, what's changing is that marketing is becoming a career pathway to a CISO in a large organization. Whoa, what? Say that again. Marketing is becoming the pathway for a job as a CISO. So that's Catherine, one of the big changes that I'm that I'm seeing and hearing on both sides, which means sellers are now going to have to really engage that conversation differently. It's not going to be about latency and speeds only, POPs and all of that. You're not going to be able to talk plumber to plumber to this guy or gal because they're talking their business growth. So as a, an industry matures, the stakeholders that are going to be involved in the decision making process and conversation is also going to change. Uh, the board is much more involved in this, for sure, but that doesn't still change the fact that the board's not going to have a super technical conversation. So the pressure is on recruiters to filter talent so that they know that these people really can have that next level conversation, that next elevated thinking. And that's where I think this uh, cyber is going to have some challenges and growing pains yet again, because it's having transformation within transformation after a pandemic coming into macroeconomic conditions that are unprecedented and geopolitical forces that, that have challenged this industry as well. So it's, a, it, it's really going to be important for organizations to engage HR and talk about outcomes, not just shopping lists and boxes. What are the business or organization outcomes that we need to be talking about? And by the way, if you are looking for work in cyber, what a great opportunity when you're interviewing, even if it's not exactly with a cyber company, ask them, who's leading the cyber conversation in your organization? How's that changing? Those are insights that you can then bring to other, uh, other conversations, other meetings. One thing about this uh, industry, Catherine, in the community is we share across you know, here's what I'm seeing. And what I'm seeing in the recruitment and in the hiring is, uh, the, yes, we have to elevate our games, no question. Well, that's a really interesting point because one of the things that when we, and, and Gordon and, and Leah have been a part of these discussions we were in in Davos in January for Cyber Future Dialogue, you know, with the Cyber Board Book um, project had been completed. We did the announcement when we were in Davos, but this was a direct outcome of our discussion in 2023, where we were all talking and waiting for the judgment of our good friend, Joe Sullivan. And we were all saying, yeah, but the role of the cyber uh, leader is no longer one, one, one dimensional. So you can't just be an IT genius. You have to be a business communicator. You've got to be an educator. So as Joe said, you, you can't be a one trick pony anymore in the scroll. You've got to bring more to the table. Leah, you're kind of living this because, you know, your, your mentors uh, have been very strongly encouraging you because of your business acumen, your understanding of the industry, but also your business acumen and communication skills that a BSO role is maybe where you should be headed. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, and you know, I, I will say in asking just a lot of CISOs how they got into the role, there is a, seldom do I ever hear a linear path, right? It's not that they say I started an IT help desk, then I went and ran a SOC, 
um, you know, was a uh, SOC analyst for years. And then I switched into GRC and then that morphed into becoming a CISO. Um, it's all different responses and all different backgrounds. Um, and sure, many of them do come from the IT realm. But that being said, I think um, where we can kind of pull everything together, right? We've got, uh, we have the frameworks for the job roles and those are always redefining. Um, those are gonna pull on many different skill sets, both from the technical side and the business side and the soft skill side and having empathy and, and many other skill sets involved, as you mentioned. And then the organizations that are needing to come together from academia to the industry, um, to uh, organizations like Cyber Future Foundation and others in the workforce. And I think we need to have more alignment from all those industries that's happening, but have more of it to further define and have, I guess, clearer pathways, but then also thinking about the ecosystem of people, right? So you've got those that are here in their top career, but looking at retirement. So how do you then funnel down to the middle management and those leaders that are coming up to replace them um, to take on the onus and the uh, mentorship to pull the younger generation or the career transitioners that are newer into the roles to help them grow into their field and figure out where those pathways are and, and how to get there um, based on all the resources out there and then keep that going in a more seamless, effective manner, right? It sounds easy to do, but it's not. And we've been trying to do this for years, but we have made a lot of inroads it's just, you know, what more do, needs to be done and what's working and let's really hone in on what the what's working and keep at that. And that's, and we, this will be kind of um, fodder for kind of the, the future discussion as we start digging into some of the other topics that we've kind of put on the table for today. Gordon, for you, again, working as a industry, as a practice leader, and then going into your work with Comtia, especially when you and I've had these discussions many times that, you know, the, the industry is so fluid and the requirements, whether it's the influx of requirements for AI, quantum coming in, discussion coming into the picture, it changes in terms of what skills are needed as a practitioner. What are you seeing right now in terms of what current state looks like? Well, it's change, changing and it's constant change, I guess is the word. Um, but to, you know, um, reiterate what, what has already been said, you know, it, a few years ago, it was a set of technical skills that positioned you ideally to work in this industry. That's evolved to today where it's business skills, it's communication skills, it's, um, team building, it's all of these things and the ability to present and, and influence the board. Um, so, you know, if we're talking at the at the C level, um, that's the evolution where you were an IT specialist and you were the CIO or or a CTO or or pick a, a designation, and you were seldom in front of the board. Well, today now you have a seat on the board. Um, so we've seen that evolution from a from a technical uh, practitioner perspective. We're seeing similar. Uh, transition where in the in the um, old days you know several years ago um, you required a set of very heavy technical skills and the criteria to join um, the cybersecurity realm was um, something like this it was five years of experience a university degree in an, uh, in an appropriate um, area so preferably uh, computer science uh, or mathematics or, you know, some some heavy duty uh, technical degree. And then you could become an entry level person in cybersecurity. Um, what we're seeing today um, is that evolution where we're looking for creativity, uh, flexibility, adaptability, um, drive, desire, all of those things combined with some fundamental technical skills and you don't need a degree. So we've, we've seen this shift occur. Now, back to, to Lynn's point, um, we are ha having to help HR who are following um, some old guidelines uh, in a lot of cases, and they've got a list as long as my arm of technical skills that they're, they're screening for. And 
one of the problems we get into is organizations that are using um, uh, automated tools to recruit and to filter candidates. And if they're using those old um, prescribed lists of skills, they're losing a lot of good candidates. And so one of the challenges we've had over the years is trying to influence HR to open up their, their hiring practices, look at things like certifications, look at things like skills, and um, use those as primary indicators, um, tie into that creativity, adaptability, communication skills, all these things, because ultimately you are working with people. You know, in the, 10 years ago, you were working with computers and probably in a dark room. Today, you're working with people and you're having to communicate and uh, raise awareness of some of the challenges that are that are coming. So we're seeing this evolution. And one of the big challenges that I talk about all the time is the fact that I think the STEM drive has done a great disservice. There's a lot of people that think they aren't smart enough because they don't have high STEM scores. They aren't smart enough to work in, in cybersecurity or in tech. And that's a misnomer. Um, there's, you know, people like me can work in tech. You can work in tech. Um, the, the point is that um, it, it, it's all these other things that are more important than your, your, your technical background or uh, what your education is, is about. It's, it's about desire, aptitude, uh, you know, and, and um, a lot of cybersecurity can be gamified, essentially. So you're a defender um, um, trying to defend against attackers or you're a penetration tester, so you're an attacker and um, somebody's trying to defend against what you're doing. So if you have, um, you if you want to make it fun, it can be fun. It can be that type of a, a gamified situation that your job can 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 be, where you come to something new and fun every day. Um, so it, so there is a place for people with various backgrounds of all types. Um, in fact, we need more women in the industry, um, and and that's an area that you know we need to have more people sponsoring. Um, and whether it's apprenticeships, it's internships, um, or just um, supporting um, diversity, uh, one of the things that, that is so important is that we have a diverse a group of people that are defending against a diverse group of attackers. You know, if it's all white men defending, um, we, we perhaps are not aware of all the, um, you know, um, cultural differences that others may have in, in the way they think, and therefore, how do we um, anticipate what their, their next move might be? Yep. So we need diversity of all sorts. And um, so, you know, yeah, back to the message to HR, uh, we can help you. We can help you. It's, it's, it's not hard. And that's that in itself is is such great news because Leah, I'm gonna take a you and I back a couple of years ago when we used to do the, you know, during the pandemic and we would do the get we did a program where we would literally give the mic to young people or people at varying stages of their career an opportunity to speak to some CFF leaders. Um, and unfortunately, Leah, you know, there's a couple of, of folks that come to mind that were told. Well, if you go and get this degree, you're, or you go and get these following certifications, you can get a CISO job. And they, these people were spending thousands of dollars and time in, in school getting degrees and coming out and, and can't find a job. Um, and, you know, the thing that one of the things that resonated the most, I think, with these young people when we were doing that program was they were getting an opportunity to not only ask questions to decision makers and put them on the spot, but they were also understanding that none of those folks that were now industry respected industry leaders had had that career path of like, do this certification, the following certifications and the job is yours. They had all traveled very diverse paths. So in this section, I really want to dig into the opportunity to chart a career path, because that was one of the recommendations that was also in our, our workforce report. And again, all of us can probably speak to that. I mean, myself, I mean, I came from a, a communications and advertising background and worked in sales, um, worked in back office. And really, at that point in time, because of a client that I had realized that there was a merging requirement for cyber, didn't know anything about it. Um, ended up meeting a couple of folks that were in this industry and heard what they did and the kind of background they had, and I was hooked. But 
I will say at that point in time, 13 years ago, getting your foot in the door was really difficult. Um, and it took a lot of perseverance to be able to get in it. But the industry had, for me, was really worth getting into it. And Lynn, I remember you and I having a number of these conversations when you were kind of charting where was the next industry you were going into. What would you talk about in terms of what you've learned about career pathing, not only for yourself, but the folks that you've worked with? Okay, so I would say that, um, you know, Catherine, when you and I first started talking about cyber, um, it, which, which, is, which is lesson one, leverage your network. So anything you want to do, odds are good, someone has done it or is also going to be much more knowledgeable. And, and you, you really, 80% of the jobs, and this is true outside of cyber, um, are not posted. And so to tap into that uh, hidden job market is, is to leverage your network. And that means you've got to be good at building some trust fairly quickly and finding some common ground. Hello, active listening skills, human skills, business acumen, all the things that we say we want to see more of in cyber, this, the activity of building out your own contact base, creating your tribe in cyber, it's going to force that upon you. And if you are a little gynophobic, we're talking about the absence of women in cyber. Well, there's a reason for that. And Catherine, during my little journey, I was pretty open with women. And I said, tell me, what's it like? What am, what am I setting myself up for? And sure enough, they were pretty honest about the fact that it is not always a comfortable and welcoming space. That cyber owns. I'm going to put this out there right now. This is not a defect of the women. They were all intelligent, capable, certified, highly credentialed. Um, this is a defect of the industry not wanting to either own it, talk about it, or do whatever. And the, and the, the solution to that is allyship. So we talked to, Catherine, you mentioned sponsors. And, and in the journey, you know, who was helpful to me in it? I was fortunate. I happened to, um, you know, again, through good networking and good due diligence on, on who I was going to work for. I asked different questions when I went into cyber. So what was great about it? What would you do? What's this, that sort of thing. But I was also very specific around my boss. So I was asking different questions, not just about, oh, is this a good company? Is the culture this or whatever? No, no, no. I wanted to find out about who I'd be working for. And you mentioned, you know, that there, you know, there's been transitions, mine and, and lots of other ones in the post-pandemic world. And I think, again, that, that what I'm leaning on in my job search is, of course, my network connections. Even the, the people I most recently worked with, as well as the people I met along the path. That is integral. And so for women and, and ev for everyone who's looking at cyber, um, you might need to lead the conversation a little bit. Ask, you know, ask that HR person or the hiring manager, how is it changing for you? What, what's challenging you? What really needs to help be helped in your business? Because you probably have to start the conversation and help them figure it out. And I, that's the same, Catherine, today as it was when I first entered the profession uh, or the industry, I would say. And I think that's great for all job seekers, no matter what age and stage you are. If you are more entry level, odds are good your job will be posted. I hope it's a current posting. I would always double check to make sure it is. And then I, you know, find out who the hiring manager is, a little bit about the culture. Mid and more senior people, that network is going to be where you're probably going to find out about a contract. And, and this is some self-reflection. Are you open to that? Would you be willing to take a contract of six or 12 or 18 months? I was. I wanted into cyber. I really believe in it and I wanted to be a part of it. So I was pretty flexible in terms of what, my, what I would be willing to engage in. In fact, my first conversation was about uh, potentially a contract to do some um, C-suite uh, ghostwriting. So in my background, I've been in, I've been a journalist. I went into B2B sales and then marketing and, and PR. So I put all the, and issues management was part of that. So I, I think I had a really neat value proposition to talk to the chief revenue officers. The other insight, Catherine, that has not changed for me is the more senior you are, the more important it is to network strategically and get as quickly as you can to the person with authority and budget. I still do information type networking, you know, meetings and calls, and I'm very happy to to pay it forward and and because a lot of people took time with me on this journey, and and do those types as well. But I did a lot of my own legwork, 
And that's still part of the journey today. Go on, you know, um, there's legislation changes taking place around the world, right? On what's what disclosure around cyber breaches, et cetera. Get up to speed on those things. If there's an organization in your country or city that has like women in cyber or just cyber in general, go to the events. Now in the world of the pandemic, we don't have to just be a blue light, <laughs> a smile and a screen. We can go in person. Um, get on a panel, talk to people, um, you know, ask, ask good questions, be an active listener and a humble student. Catherine, that has still been foundational in the pre-pandemic job search and in the one I'm on now. And we heard that um, from not only those looking for their first job in cyber, whether they're coming out of school or trying to do that transition. We even heard from senior executives. One gentleman that came to mind was just finishing up active military service well regarded and rewarded for his expertise and leadership in cyber for the government and came out and was dumbfounded that he just thought well i my resume reads and i'll just apply for jobs on jobs boards and and didn't realize till six months into his journey that that's not going to work um leah for you you know it from both counseling folks that are looking for a career path or looking for that first opportunity to being the job seeker. And I mean, probably you're the one, most networked person I know. Um, what do you want to, what's your perspective on terms of career pathing right now? No, um, well, thank you for that. But no, I have uh, ways to go to keep doing that, but it is important. Um, so one, I'd say leverage, build your network because um, unfortunately the whole notion of, I'm just going to apply to all the jobs online it doesn't work, right? It really does involve having somebody you know, take your resume, refer you in and do that extra step. Um, that's that's how I've mostly gotten any interviews is that path versus just applying online, number one. Um, number two, leverage what you can in your existing jobs. So for example, I knew the skill sets I needed to build um, as I was, you know, plotting out my journey. So I would take advantage of it in my current roles at my current companies where, okay, if I needed to have a better understanding of certain technologies, I literally just went to the engineering and cybersecurity teams and said, I want to learn, help me understand. I'm curious. And they love that. They will bring you on. They will teach you. They will give, they, they love talking about what they're doing and they want others to learn it with them and help them. Um, so leverage all of that that you can um, hone in on your skill sets that you have already um, and and market those because those are translatable to everything in cyber. Mostly if you, you will find that um, like a lot of what Lynn was mentioning, I call them OSINT skills today. Right. Um, and some CISOs I've talked to recently, they've um, mentioned some of those things that they're trying to hone in on because they came up through, you know, the pure engineering side and they're now trying to gain those other skill sets as they find themselves in a business role. Um, and then, you know, really um, look at the different job descriptions out there um, and understand where you have those translatable skill sets and make that known. And, and I will say we all have to be accountable, every single one of us in every single position, whether it's in HR, the hiring manager, the CISO, um, whomever it is within the organization, or if you're the job seeker, you need to market yourself. Um, not everything's going to be perfect and it, it's going to take a lot of accountability on everybody um, and coming together. So and sharing, but there are there's no shortage of resources. So I'd say take advantage of them. I mean, I'm an introvert, but I ha, you know I have to become um, with extrovert <laughs> tendencies to really um, establish my network and get to know people. And I will say that nine out of ten people, when you ask for help, they will help you, especially when they see that you're doing the work. So I will also say that it takes putting the work into things when people know that you are capable, you may not have all the skill sets. I, I'm not the most technical person on the planet, but people know that you're um, willing to learn, you can learn, and that you have that desire and motivation and passion. You can do anything and it just takes time and work. So just put do the work in and you'll get there. That's that's awesome. And, and again, you're um, a shining example of um, that curiosity um, to actually 
ask those questions and engage your in an environment that you're working in. Now, I'm going to be a little more specific for you, and, and I want to give you some context around the career path. When we did the when we did Cyber Talent Week, um, one of the things when we were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion was obviously you know government wants more women in cyber we want more people in of color in in cyber we want the neurodiverse we've talked about it from different aspects the socioeconomic was one that came up as well we had one young lady who talked about the fact her family was a re, had recently immigrated to the US um, she was she had developed an aptitude in high school and a real keen interest in it but the money for her to go to school wasn't readily available. So she was doing night school but for these courses. But in order for her to do it, she was working all day long. Um, she would, kidding not, she would work, she would start work at 7.30. She would work till four o'clock. She would get on a bus. She would travel for two hours to go to school. She would do her course and then she would get off school at nine o'clock and travel all the way home and get up and do this again the next day. Because this is the only way she could afford it. So one of the things, and then we also heard about, you know, when we were doing the Cyber Future Summit in San Antonio in, in 2022, that, you know, in large urban areas like San Antonio, there's a robust of ways in which to engage in cybersecurity and learn and grow and get opportunity. But travel literally an hour outside of San Antonio. And in many cases, you have to go to the local library to get internet. And you know the socioeconomic and geographic realities um, go into this. So what's career, career pathing like for those people that maybe be, because of socioeconomic or the DEI, DEI perspective, mm -hmm. what does the landscape for career pathing look like right now? Catherine, you hit such a you hit such a soft spot for me because I'm exactly that kid that you just described. Um, my folks couldn't afford. I came from a really really small township in South Africa, and I was underprivileged. Um, I, we didn't have a lot um, at one point. I had to be pulled out of school when I was a kid because my folks couldn't afford all three of us in school at the same time. Um, and I get emotional about it because when I think about those humble beginnings and where I am today, it's taken a lot of hard work. It has. And um, everything Leah said is exactly what we look for, right? It's that passion. It's that willing to go the extra mile. It's the willing to do a little bit more than everybody else and, and stand out. And and I was that kid who was working uh, a full-time job, um, still trying to help my folks at home while trying to pay for my varsity fees. And it took me seven years to get that degree, but I did it and I got it. And eventually I was super proud. Yes, um, my folks were super proud too, because I was the first kid in, in our family to have gotten a degree. Um, my folks didn't get degrees. They, they barely finished school, you know, so I was that kid. And, and there is hope. There is hope. There is a career path for you. You just have to work really hard at it. And what I always say, and um, last week I interviewed a couple of underprivileged kids for an internship that I want to do now. And I looked at these girls and they were 18, 19, 20 years old, really young, right? And you could see the inexperience. You could see, you could see the, the nervousness, right? But you could see the passion. And that's what got me. That's what grabbed me is the fact that they went out and they researched that there's hundreds of different parts in cybersecurity. You don't only have one path to go into, which is the CISO path. You've got forensics. You've got, you know, the SOC analyst. You've got your defensive team, your offensive team. And what we always view cybersecurity or security as is that it's this, it's this offensive kind of attack type of syndrome. Lynn laughed yesterday, you know, it was it's the, the hoodie and the guy sitting behind the hoodie. And that's not it. It's the guys that are behind the front lines that are fighting the good fight. And we're trying to prevent those things. So there's also there's the other side of security that we need to like, you know, we need to expose. But we also need you guys to go in, delve into what is those different career paths that we can get into. And that's what I always find is something I look for is that, are you excited to get into cyber? Are you excited? Oh, my darling. Are you excited um, to be part of cyber and, and, and explore this brilliant career path that we have? Um, and just say hello. <laughs> um, and, and just, and, and just, yeah, and just do it, you know, um, passion, 
skills are something that you can learn, but so is education. So is something that you, you know, you can always learn qualifications. You can always learn how to do a job. But you've got to also have the soft skills like Lynn and Leah already reiterated. And I think that's that's really important. So if you really if you really have those fundamentals, there's nothing stopping you. That's awesome. You know, um, the inspiring kind of the career next generation, Gordon, I like you've been speaking about this for not only in official roles um professionally but i think you you've know, got a commitment to the volunteerism side of things um what's your perspective on career paths now well i think that a uh, couple of things one is nobody's going to do it for you uh, a lot of companies that i worked for didn't have career paths i had employees come to me and say how do i get from where i am to your position and there was no career path provided hr didn't have any any guidance we um we, we we helped people the best we could but um you know the things that i i think are really critical in this is is curiosity uh flexibility adaptability and for the people that are um curious and they want to explore these things um they, they will find a way the the second important point is that uh, and i think lay said it earlier is the pathway isn't linear. You don't go from from here to there in a career in a straight line. You typically have to build a foundation going back and forth a little bit. So, you know, you need to build that that um, foundation out um, to have the strength and capability to gr grow up. And um, so, a lot of people they need to take a deep breath and go, oh, that that you know, I don't go from um, this technical role to a manager role to the C CISO role in in two steps. I have to go from this technical role into a network administrator role into um, another cybersecurity role and and then up into a management role and then, you know, perhaps move into marketing or into sales or into some other thing and then back into the CISO role. It's It's not a linear path. So, um, you know, people have to do the work themselves. They have to make that investment in themselves, become lifelong learners. Um, there are a lot of tools out there. CompTIA has a career pathing tool. Um, NICE has a cybersecurity workforce framework that has career pathing. So people can go out and take a look at these things and understand, um, you know, the different jobs that they can perform along the way. I was I was reading yesterday um, cyber um, security um, magazine has published 50 jobs and uh, there's a, a few other organizations that have published uh, job lists in cybersecurity. Um, so go take a look at those jobs and you know some of them are are stepping stones for other jobs that you can move up. Um, you know you, you yes the some of these roles are um, CISO roles and they pay really well but that's the end game that's not where you start you need to start you know as a network administrator or um, as a infrastructure technician work your way up to understanding networking and then work your way into entry-level cybersecurity, and then work your way up and broaden all those skills out communication skills business skills um, etc in order to be able to to move forward so um, I know it's kind of a convoluted answer, but um, it's not it's not a simple um, pathway. They put it that way. No, actually, it's a wonderful kind of foray into the next topic, which is skills and, and qualifications. So I'm going to put you on the spot yet again um, because we wanted to talk about what. Yeah, and we get this quite at CFF a lot, especially with those folks that are looking to transition into their first career in cyber, like career transitioners then they're trying to get into the industry and young people that are looking at what course I should be taking. And we, and what each year CFF, we do uh, internships. We never with, usually it's been college and university students. Last year, we started bringing in high school students because high school students had had an aptitude and interest in cyber, but weren't sure what they should be taking post-secondary from a CompTIA. I'll ask you to put your, your CompTIA hat on. Um, 
you know, what are, in terms of developing new programs and certifications, because as we talked about before, before this, the industry is extremely fluid. What are some of those, what are some of the programs that are a, the most popular right now? And what are some of the program development requests you're getting in terms of, is it AI driven cyber? What, what are you, what are you folks seeing? So AI is, is becoming important, but that's, let, let me start at the foundation. Yeah. So um, really you need IT fundamentals to begin and you need some IT infrastructure, um, education, knowledge, and experience. So um, one of the things I, I recall from when I was looking for my very first job when I graduated school, um, you can't get a job without experience and you can't get experience without a job. And so sometimes you, you know, you, you need to look at an internship, an apprenticeship or something, even volunteerism, where you can get your hands on equipment and get the opportunity to prove yourself. And so um, the education piece is important, but the experience piece is just as important. And so um, build yourself a strong foundation, as I was saying earlier, IT infrastructure, the next step is networking and then the entry level, you know, then with three or so years experience of IT infrastructure and networking, you can make your entry into cybersecurity. Um, so we're seeing that as, as the pathway, if you will. As far as um, technology today, one of the, the fundamental jobs or lower level jobs in, in um, or tasks in cybersecurity that, that is mundane is um, threat analysis, looking at all the various threats and determining what's real, what isn't real, what needs to be investigated further by the really smart people. Um, that's where AI can come in. AI can provide a huge um, hand to the organizations in order to um, sort through all that information and pick the, the primary uh, threats uh, from the noise from the threats that can be handled by automation. And uh, that's where we, you know, I see um, AI being a, a big advantage as we move forward is enabling companies to deal with the millions of attacks that they're getting, you know, each and every day and sorting through the, you know, the, the handful that are real serious threats. So, and I, and I guess, Leah, if we put the, put your, you've been working in consulting for the last couple of years and working with large clients. Um, what are the types of skills that your, your clients were looking for in terms of their workforce? Where were the, the where were the gaps? Where were the, the emerging opportunity? Where, and where were it, again, from the soft skills side of things, where were you seeing those that were trying to advance their career, trying to develop those skills? Because I have a lot of folks that I spoke to that are very highly technical that are now taking communications courses because they need to be able to be better writers, better presenters, that type of thing. What were you seeing from the consulting side? Yeah, um, so definitely active listening, right? Um, really understanding each person, what they're trying to say and what their pain point is. And it's gonna be different for each stakeholder, um, but it's important to have that understanding because at the end of the day, you might find that um, they might say it four different ways among four different people, but they're all maybe trying to communicate the same thing for one mutual goal, but you have to translate that, right? And you have to have that understanding from them. Um, ask questions to also help yourself better figure out what they're um, really trying to solve. And then become the problem solver, right? Um, across the different stakeholders, translating between the technical and the business and coming together with, um, you know, ideas and recommendations that bring them together um, and bring them to a common understanding of that main goal that they're trying to get to, to achieve and how they can do that um, cost effectively and efficiently. Um, I think those are the biggest things, really be that active listener, ask questions, and it is going to take, to some degree, you have to decipher the language, right, and break down to get them to realize that, or you will realize that they might all be trying to say the same thing or want the same thing, but they're saying it in different ways. So you 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 have to focus on where's the translation and not getting lost in that translation. 
And so, and then again, that communication, not only in terms of developing and articulating your own personal brand, I think we can say the industry as a whole needs to be, do, has done a better job than when, if we look back on two years ago, you know, that was one of the recommendations that came out was, hey, our industry needs to do a better job communicating outwardly as to what are the what are the perks, benefits, and what's the de depth of opportunity that a career in cyber has to offer? Um, Lynn, from your perspective, is our industry doing that right now? Like, are we telling a good story or where do you think there's a gap in the narrative? Just based on, um, again, the sales and the sales engineers, that's that's the sandbox I was, and I don't mean sandbox in terms of testing the, the, <laughs> the software. I mean, that's where professionally I was. I would say it's improved, Catherine. I think there's that you're we are seeing some ROI for that. What's interesting, though, is um, for anyone who m might be more technically inclined and thinking about that pathway that uh, Gord mentioned and Nadia has mentioned, um, don't discount sales. Uh, most surprisingly, most sellers in cyber are joined and partnered with an expert who has the technical. What's fascinating to me is when I when I was looking at going into this industry, those are the guys, that, these are the two people I wanted to do a lot of information calls and find out about. And it's interesting because we don't seem to do, um, as an industry, uh, I think, still the full service of what an enriched career, anything around revenue is or sales. Sales is not a dirty profession. It's not a bad thing. If you have technical skills and in your, you're really great um, or nerdy as, as Nadia would say or geeky sales has a need for you because that's where that's where it hits the road that's where someone is going to make a decision that could change the outcome of their business or their city or their state or country because they're going to make a, a better decision for a more secure posture that's that's why this is such a neat a neat industry and in, in any profession in it so i would say the um we still could do, I think, a better job of, of reminding everyone that at the end of all of your activities and trainings, the reason for it is a better world, right? And so whether you start out um, with a, a partner with a sales guy, that's okay. That's great. Um, because you may then pivot into some other aspect of it, into training or into working with government. The, once we're in, those, the journey can be quite, quite interesting and exciting. So don't discount sales or revenue growing um, aspects of your technical skills. They're needed there too. That's awesome. And again, I, I love the fact that we're talking more and more about the diversity of opportunity in a career in cyber, because, you know, one of the things that, again, that was, and this is an advancement, because two years ago, when we did the, 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 the Cyber Talent Week, and we did the report, we heard con, um, consistent messages from people saying, yeah, but I didn't really know that there was an opportunity in sales, or I didn't know I could put my HR skills to, um, to 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 work in this industry. Even on the finance side of things, we've had finance students that have said, you know, I'm really, I really excited about this industry, and I'm, I feel like this is a great opportunity for me to get my foot in the door. Not as a a practitioner, um, do you feel that there? What do you think the the requirements to do the job that you're doing and future jobs that you want to do, what are those skills that you believe that are needed um, in order to be successful? And again, I'm going to reference to a little bit back when we did the prep call yesterday, which was in incredibly insightful. And I love the level of passion you you all have about the industry and, and the opportunity. But as we talked about too, there, there certainly were some challenges that were presented to women working in cyber, especially during the pandemic. Um, where do you think things in terms of skills and opportunity sit for, the, for our women that are leaders in cybersecurity yeah. right now? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna, you know, um, I've also worked quite well with a lot of certification industries like IC, uh, EC Council, and the likes and and um gordon all due respect <laughs> but I, I i slightly disagree on the you know have to have a technical background and i think that's where it starts for a lot of women is we discount that we always say ah oh, i'm not technical enough 
I don't have the technical experience. I can't apply for that position, right? Um, that degree that I told you that was so hard earned was marketing management. <laughs> it had nothing to do with anything. <laughs> and I know some of my good friends who are CISOs. One of one of my really good friends who's a group CISO for Africa for a big, big telecoms uh, company is a chartered accountant. Um, you have two phenomenal women who are on this call right now, Lynn and Leah, who do not have a technical background. So even though I do, uh, and uh, I never ever say I don't, um, I never discount these powerful females that come next to me uh, because I know they can do the job just as well as I can. And again, it comes back to your, your, your actual acumen on how well you want to do the job, right? And how much are you willing to learn? Um, I've never had today in my life. I'm currently studying my master's and I had to learn quickly, really quickly. Um, and it's not for a lack of trying, but I think it's, it's you know, oh gosh, it's a back to that mindset. Am I technical enough to do this? Do I understand enough about the networking? And then I found a resource and I popped it in and I hope you'd pop it into the chat for the rest of the people as well, which is Hack the Box, which is a free resource. And you don't have to go set up your own network. You don't have to go set up your own server. You don't have to have Kali Linux downloaded, right? You can go into Hack the Box, everything's set up for you, and they will show you step-by-step -step how to do it. And that's learning a technical skill with zero technical capability. Um, another one, and I've uh, popped it also into the chat, Catherine, is another free resource, which is ISC Squared is offering a cyber foundation course that is free for the course as well as the exam for the first million people to register. And I think they're sitting at 700 and something thousand at the moment. So better work quickly and go and get that certification, but it's there, right? That's a, that's a free certification that is really highly valued inside of uh, any uh, company that you go and work for because IC is one of the benchmark industry kind of standards for certifications. Um, I myself don't have a lot. I've got a few certifications that are in cybersecurity, but what I think has got me far is my work experience as well. And I'm, I'm able to walk into a room and able to talk to a company and cross over from a technology perspective into a people perspective. And I can change that, that communication uh, and, and say to guys, hey, instead of saying, you know what, don't plug your USB stick in because it's a risk. Yeah, but what's the risk? So change that language to say, guys, you know what? Someone could have put really malicious code onto your that USB stick. You have no idea what is on it. When you've plugged it in, it could have put something onto your machine and you don't even know it's there. And we could have not and could have affected the whole network. Go into the story, you know, and that's something I've developed and I've learned along the way is you've got to be able to talk to the business and the people inside the business. Nobody understands our tech talk. Nobody understands all the terms and we've got hundreds. We could probably come up with a dictionary of all the acronyms that we have in cybersecurity. Some of them I don't even uh, remember. <laughs> I always laugh when someone asked me to come and speak on APTs once. And I said, the only APTs I know um, in my house are the anti-poop tablets, right? That I give my kids. <laughs> so I can't really talk about that. Um, but it's knowing where your strengths lie and 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 lean into that and and i think work on those things because that then gives you confidence to go and try the harder stuff so i think there's there's a lot of free uh, resources that are available on the net right now we just have to find them linkedin has tons and tons of people that are always putting out a lot of free ai courses that google and all of them are having right now um, and if you search for them you can find them reach out to me if you really um, looking because i'm always sending them to my network and to my mentees um and then also for me what's really important is also reaching out and i think leah and len and gordon touched on this already is, is reaching out to your network right but also looking for someone who's going to possibly mentor you um how i became a mentor is i fell into it and it was a lady who was a software developer and she was my first mentor uh mentee apologies and she literally messaged me on LinkedIn and said, I want to get into cyber. Do you know how? And I said, I can help you, you know, and I took the time and 
and she's she she knew a lot more about cybersecurity than she thought she did because she didn't realize that her job had so much to do with cyber and risk and risk management. Yeah. And that's the thing is making sure that you tie back because there's so much of your job that you're doing on a daily basis. And also, I think the generation that has come in now, they're so tech advanced. They're so tech advanced already. They're, we're not going to need IT guys going forward. I can I can guarantee you that. People already, these guys, they come in, they 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 sorting our stuff out, right? And I'm like, okay, so I, I actually don't, um, you know, I don't need to teach a kid how to use a phone or how to use a laptop anymore. They know, they instinctively have that. And I think we need to leverage off that is that, they already have the skills. Let's just get them to tap into it. That's excellent. And you know, one of the things that um, we did a, a recent kind of roundtable around more specifically around hiring practices and recruiting. And one of the things, again, we keep referencing back to the white paper, but one of the things was recommendation was we needed to, to the industry needed to establish more advanced practices of identifying talent. Because at that point in time, let's be honest, um, a lot of hiring recruitment specialists that were getting the specifications from a hiring manager were getting a checklist. Checklist, I need the following skills, following. And if whether they were, you know, putting those into the bot that was going to assess those as you applied online, or if they were having that discussion and they were going, well, you know, this candidate, you know, had strong soft skills, but didn't have the following certification. So, you know, we can't, we can't place them. We've seen a difference and we're seeing a lot more creativity coming from the recruitment side of things, which is great because as you said, a lot of these aptitudes of the next generation, they've already got it. I mean, I've got a six year old uh, niece who manages my phone comes and go, Oh, you got to switch that on. That's why it doesn't work. They have those skills. So I agree, you know, the, the, the soft skills and the mentorship are going to be important on the professional development and the networking side of things, because all of you have talked about the importance of that. Um, I really want to dig into this one a little more too, because I, I don't think we can in, we, I don't think we can emphasize that enough, not only from a job search perspective, also from a professional development perspective in expanding your career, but also from a philanthropic and giving back. Because there's mm -hmm. one thing that we've learned over the last couple of years between, you know, the what's happening, what's happened in Afghanistan, what's happened in um, the Ukraine, um, the cyber is an overarching aspect of our life now. And our industry is being asked to, and CFF, we've, you know, we're involved in, in supporting Afghan um, crisis in the early weeks of it. We've been asked to support some of the initiatives happening in the Ukraine. One thing that has been so humbling, especially from the CFF community side, is our ability to say, yeah, you know what, I want to help. So we'll start right now with Lynn, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, because as I said, you, you know, you're looking for that next opportunity in, mm -hmm. um, in cybersecurity industry. How important has the networking and what's been the receptivity of people that you've asked for for help? So relationship equity. So I'm going to co quote Catherine Keith Ferrazzi because um, he's the guru. He's, he's really, really good. If you need to upskill in this, and I did, and I'm doing it all the time, by the way, there, you don't hit a plateau in this. This is a life skill. What Catherine's asking me to talk about networking cuts across all professions, all ages and stages of your career. If you haven't started it yet, start. It's not too late. It's not too early. You're right on time. So what I did for professional development in that area was, you know, I bought great books. Keith Ferrazzi's Never Read Alone. Um, if you want to upskill in things like your speaking, your public speaking, your comfort in presentation skills, uh, Toastmasters is still one of the best. It's, it's really, really good. Uh, that said, uh, what I am finding different in my network outreach now is I have to really lean heavily on my warm intros. So the, because my search is focused on the person with authority and budget who would look at someone at a more senior level, that means I've got to go up the food chain to try and get time on his or her calendar. Um, that's tough. 
And uh, networking has been, I think, misunderstood. You don't commit random acts of networking and just try and get some time on somebody. It is about co-creation of value. So I look for things, uh, for example, Catherine, part of my search strategy is I joined Women Get On Board, which is an organization which helps women uh, identify board opportunities. And that's a way of giving back because I see that as, you know, opportunity as a way to have that cyber conversation, as well as amongst women who are, you know, looking to get on either a paid or, or, or for not-for-profit board. And the, the other thing I would say is, I think it's incumbent on all of us, if we're given an ask for a networking meeting, um, as much as possible, uh, to say yes and understand the person asking for the meeting might be a little more entry level in their career journey. Uh, they may not have everything super polished, but they'll get there. The most important thing is is being available. And I find in the post-pandemic world, Catherine, a lot more people were probably being asked in cyber for some of these meetings. Um, I would say overall, the toughest industry sometimes to network into, ironically, is cyber. And the two toughest professions to get time on the calendar, sales and HR, which is interesting. Salespeople, when I refer uh, folks who say, hey, this guy's interested in a, a career in cyber sales and he's, he's a, a seasoned guy, he'd like to talk to someone. No, uh, I don't have any jobs. Well, the networking ask isn't about, do you have a job? And you're going to like, so there's always an element of this with, which includes some sort of education about what is a networking meeting really about. It is co-creating value for each other. And it's finding something that I can do that's helpful for you. I always end my networking meeting with a thank you, of course. So good manners, Catherine, super important. Finish that call off with a thank you, a deep appreciation. Um, oftentimes in our careers, we're not taught those those what I'll call corporate or, or professional manners. But do finish off that call with a thank you. And I always offer, whether it's, and this is my actual script, whether it's 10 minutes, 10 months, or 10 years from now, if there's anything I can do to help you accelerate success, facilitate a warm intro, I won't put the parameters on the check, but you have a blank check with me. Please do circle back and let me know how I can help. Interestingly, the people that often take me up on that are parents. And they're looking for someone. <laughs> yes. yes. Now, I, unlike a lot of the folks on this on this uh, wonderful discussion, I wasn't blessed with children. So I have to be very intentional and remind myself to remind folks, please, if your children going into university, are they studying PR? Are they studying something that maybe is a profession I have some experience in? Of course, I'm happy to have that. That's the, it's our duty, I think, and and, a, and an honor to help the next generation further down the path uh, and be successful. As a Gen Xer, I didn't encounter a lot of that in my career. It was pretty much, hey, you're lucky you got the job. That's that's our, our career path. Excel and maybe you'll get to keep the job. There's your career path as a Gen Xer, right? So I, I, that's what I find is really important. When you get that meeting, upskill on how to have a good networking meeting. There's some great books on it. There's the 20 minute networking meeting, um, practice, and then always thank them and go back to the warm intro. That's what's really important, Catherine. People are not accepting, hi, I'm, I see we share this or, I, you know, don't do that. No one, no one will take the time for that. But a warm intro that's, that pretty much says, you know, based on your trust of me, I feel comfortable recommending that you spend some time with Nadia. Give her some time on the calendar. I think you're going to, I think you guys are going to have a great conversation. And then after the conversation, it is really nice for Natty. Natty, I'm using you as an example. You're, you're my role model in this. To come back to me and say, I had a great convo with so-and-so. It was really, really helpful. And you know what? We found out we're going to work on these two, two new things together, which is fantastic. Circle back. It's good manners to the person who made the intro. Let them know what happened, any next steps that need to be taken. And I will tell you, if you don't, demonstrate this. I have had people, Catherine, recently as yesterday, reach out to me and say, that one will never get another, do not, he will never get any other time on my calendar. Wasn't prepared, was disrespectful, didn't thank, a whole bunch of the most basic things. Yes. You get one chance on that first impression. And I don't care whether you're a board director, CEO, it doesn't matter anymore. You're t that's, it does not matter. You get one chance. Make the best impression, 
operate with integrity, treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's how your name will come up in those all important meetings when you're not there. And they're talking about some job or some need that has to be filled. And someone's going to be able to say, you know, I met with someone recently who's just like that. That's why you want to do this with integrity and respect for everyone that you meet. I love the term co-creating value because I will quickly say one pet peeve I have because it, it literally happens probably once to twice a week is I will get a reach out from somebody on LinkedIn that wants to join my network. And I'm always interested in, in meeting new folks and people that are maybe reaching out because they're interested in our, our commercial side of CFF or they're interested in CFF. But when I instantly accept an invite and I get the message back that says, we have the following technology that would be really interesting for your members, or I do, you know, professional development for sales leaders. And I would really like to talk to you about the following thing. That's not, that's very, that's not reciprocal. It's not co-creating value. And then a lot of times I won't respond. So I love the, the whole messaging and what you're saying in terms of using that is driving that reciprocal value. Gordon. Catherine, sorry, just before yeah. I, I, I sure. finish off on that very theme, one of the CFOs in my network uh, has has developed a pretty. I'm going to call. I'm borrowing from him, so you can learn all the time, even though I've even taught this. And his it, when he gets a, an outreach like that, which is effectively a cold call, when you think about it. Um, he pings them back and says, uh, I'm always interested, as you are, to join, to meet new people and, and find out how we can help each other. Uh, but before I accept you as a member of my network, which is real equity, by the way, um, let's let's schedule some time and find out uh, what it is you think you want to want to do. And that way he, he really gets them to filter. Uh, are they just adding coll a collection or do they want a connection? Yeah. And that person who did that, that's a seller who is and sadly misrepresenting everything. And, and the very thing we, we all want to teach our sellers not to do is to do a bait and switch where you've reached out for one reason, supposedly on LinkedIn, and then you've turned it, tried to turn it into a sales call. Yeah. That's not integrity. So and I 100% agree with that. And in terms of those reciprocal invitations and, and Gordon, you did this for Val and I last week and introduced us to, to um, an organization that you do work with. What are some of the parameters that you will go through in terms of before you facilitate and make those introductions? And Because you got a massive network. What are some of the considerations you have in terms of making those connections? Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, they, they can't be random. They need to be people that you have um, experience with that you can vouch for. Um, I won't provide an introduction, a personal introduction with with um, a, a, like a reference if I haven't worked closely with the people. So um, where I've worked with somebody over the years, over a number of years and have experienced that integrity and that um, co-creation of value, I will share that and I will um, um, refer to that. Um, and, and that reflects on me. So, you know, if, if somebody's just coming to me saying, can you introduce me over here? Well, no, I can't if, if I haven't got the experience with you. So I, I think that, that that speaks highly of um, relationships. And, you know, as, as others have been saying, your network is, is critical. I know years ago, I found myself between jobs. Uh, I reached out to my network and my pre, pri, previous boss um, said, hey, I've got a job for you here at Compaq. Come, come, come to work at Compaq Computer Corporation. You've never heard of them. You know, they're this little small company, but uh, it did me well. So I think I think network is is critical and you can't abuse it. You need to respect it um, and and use it with integrity. And I 100% agree. And that's another request that folks will make. And if I don't, I'm the same way. If I don't have a, I haven't worked with you and I don't have a professional knowledge of you, I don't feel con I will not make that introduction. Um, Leah, from the the kind of the volunteerism. Um, philanthropic side and feel free to talk about how awesome CFF is. Um, 
you've been very involved in the networking from the, you know, getting involved with not-for-profits. You know, you've worked with CFF. You do a lot of work in running some of the meetups that are in the Dallas area where you are. Um, and also working with other organizations that have reached out to you. What, from a networking standpoint, has that getting involved in organizations like CFF been a benefit for you in terms of your career advancement? Um, it Honestly, it's the community. It's knowing that you have others to, well, one, I like to help. I just, I like to help. I believe in the causes. Um, most of the time I'm going to be associated with those organizations like CFF where what they're doing is something that I'm very passionate about as well. And I want to help contribute to the cause um, and make it better, right? Make the improvements that we need for the next uh, future generations to come. That's number one, the, the mutual um, passion, if you will. But also, I mean, just knowing that, you know, none of us have all the answers in, in our jobs, even if we're at the highest in our careers, at a CISO or, or even a CEO, right? You always have a bench, right? a community, a group of people. And you need to have those people to come together with, to learn from, to share with, to collaborate with, to take from, to give, right? The whole ecosystem of, um, you know, what you put out there, it does come back, but, you know, you can't just be a taker, right? Um, so having the people that are like-minded that you can be around with, learning the diversity, the different mindsets, um, and just being part of a community, that's really important. Um, we can't do this alone, right? I don't think any of us sit here and say, I'm going to do life alone, right? You have your friends, you have your family, you have different things you're involved in, tennis, whatever, pickleball is the latest here in the U.S. Um, so it really is the community sense. And, you know, if you like to help and you want to give back because, you know, you benefit from it as well. Um, I'd say get involved with the organizations that you're passionate about, the work that they do, that um, you can contribute to. You will you will have takeaways as well. Um, but none of us can do anything alone in this world. And we need more people that are like minded to come together. But um, from diversity, from different um, levels of experience, from different backgrounds, that's how we're going to get the best. That's awesome. Nadia. Leah kind of did a Leah reference the diversity, equity, inclusion. You've talked very passionately from your own personal perspective about that. And and we see different. One thing I, I, I love also about this industry and this community is the amount of um, I don't want to say activism, but about the, the desire for progress that that our industry has and the willingness to get behind these things from a getting more visible people of visible minority, getting more women involved. What has that committing yourself to that? What has that done in terms of enriching your, your view on um, not only the industry and your career, but the access to people and diverse people that maybe you wouldn't have met if this wasn't something that was so richly ingrained in you. Yeah. So what I find really important is personal brand. Right. And, and and I learned that lesson very quickly over the last two years is if you have a personal brand that you are putting out there, you have to show your good sides and your best sides and what do you believe in. Right. So I'm really active on LinkedIn. I post videos. I do a lot of those type of things. I, like I said, I started Journeys to Inspire because I was so passionate about diversity, inclusion and equity. And I think for me, when you put that personal brand out there, you're kind of standing for something. And when you stand for something, what happens is people who stand for similar are attracted to that. So you start building a network automatically because they kind of come to you and then you find them as well. So that's what I loved is that it it was this it was this cascading kind of effect. Once I built my own personal brand on what I wanted to achieve, I then connected with all these like-minded individuals as well male and female and was awesome and i remember distinctly i started off you know all the feminism kind of and i changed my mind because i did a talk um at one of our in south africa we've got CISO alliances and it's, it's a south african african um also uk based kind of group that a lot of security professionals belong to um and 
you know, we share a lot. We share our struggles. We share what's happening in the world, what's happening in South Africa and Africa. And there's a lot of camaraderie. And we did a diversity talk the one day and inclusion. And I, and I kind of stood and I was like, ah, I'm going to show you guys the real, you know, differences between men and female. And I did this phenomenal kind of, um, it was in, it was it was so interesting and I'd wish I'd videoed it properly, but I had all the the females and men stand on, on, in the line and and we went outside and there were about fifty of us and there were only nine females in the room, right and 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 I said okay so like you know I made the females stand up first and then you could see there was a clear cut that, like you know there's not enough women firstly and then I said I want you to answer in the negative and I said if you if you never experienced or never been asked to make a cup of coffee or get the food or you know take a step forward and i had asked all these things have you ever, have you never had sexual you know um uh, innuendos thrown at you or ha harassed or whatever and there were five real questions based on all things that every female would have experienced and at the end of it majority of the females had not taken one step forward and all the men had and what it really stood out and showed was that there is a clear cut difference on the experiences we have in the workplace, right? And wow. by me talking about how difficult it was for me, especially becoming a mother, having to still work like I, I'm, I, I, I'm not a mom, and then having to mother like I don't have a job. And I had to return to work in maternity leave, um, you know, uh, uh, pump milk in the bathroom because there was no space for me. I had a full team of only males in the senior senior management team. I was the only female. And then I was the only one that had kids. And nobody understood. And everybody booked meetings for me. And I missed out in the first two years of my older son's life that way. And I started talking about it. And when I started talking about it, everybody started saying, that's exactly how I feel. That happened to me. And every female that happened to, we formed this community. And, and now it's like, we're never going to let it happen again. There needs to be a change. Let's change the narrative. Let's not let the next generation feel that way. And for me, being vulnerable allowed other people to feel vulnerable too. And we're all in this together, and it's okay not to be okay. Um, and I know I slightly went off topic, but I think it's important because it talks a lot into sometimes if, you, if you've never experienced a a, a um, a problem with diversity or inclusion. If you've never experienced it, if you've never been a, been a woman, if you've never been a woman of color, if you've never been a mother, um, you won't know what it was like. So unless we tell you, you're going to keep going on thinking it doesn't happen. That is such a powerful message and something that resonates. You know, we've talked about the, the, the mental health aspects, the, the, met, the stress aspects of, of a career in certain areas you're working in cyber and you know that that mental health impact so never apologize for that because i am 100 percent behind you it's it's okay to be not okay um and val rejoined us here um val can we i'll encourage linkedin um viewers right now if they want to post any questions uh please do so uh, val any comments as you were kind of actively listening in the background about what we've talked about so far I was actually soaking it in. So, so this is a this is an incredible conversation, and uh, uh, so much in common with what we have had before in these forums, uh, but also very unique. And um, uh, Nadia, thank you for you know sharing sharing uh, you know the words of uh, your experience. It needs a lot of courage, self motivation to actually share that. It's not easy for uh, for anyone to come up and and. You know, talk about things that are not your strengths, but those are actually strengths. Uh, we also got the beautiful moment of your daughter joining us uh, in this call. It still reminds me of the time when you know my son is to crawl in and not to disturb him, but still try to try to listen in what's going on. So, I think that's that's the nature of life. It's important to uh, you know accept and embrace um, the real us, so that we can actually uh, contribute back in our best uh, self. Uh, and also, you know, find our next version of the better that we want to be. Um, so, no, thank you. Uh, this has been, again, very, very insightful, incredible. 
uh, discussion, each of the points, I believe, goes into, um, you know, prove the point that uh, our, our profession is very much in 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 the place where it need, it's maturing, but needs a, a lot of um, contribution from all of you in your diverse um, backgrounds to add in, whether, you know, Lynn talked very passionately about the sales, uh, you know, uh, background and how that in, enables the business. And so did Leah about her experience from marketing to joining a cyber program. Nadia, your experience overall, uh, you know, uh, going into motherhood with the, uh, you know, which is a which is a supreme responsibility in itself, but also taking up executive responsibilities, not having a direct mentor or someone that you can look up to in your organization, which you had to kind of learn from and and then share with others, including your mentee who has been uh, who who probably didn't know what she knew already, right? So, and and so has gotten your experience from uh, the the work that you have done in the industry and what you are uh, you know what you have done um, most recently at comte i think all of these are collective knowledge and uh, and experience that will uh, kind of bring us together and also help us build a more um, robust uh, you know industry and profession um, to to recap i would say you know that, that this is a conversation to be continued uh, i think we need to take away from this uh, the several experiences that we have in our different roles. And uh, if you just go, you know, if I can personally just go back to Nadia, you and I have been part of a cohort, so to speak, right? It's a lifelong learning. And uh, and and those cohorts and the discussions that we have had, uh, I mean, without even having any of the participants here, you can hear that resonating from the discussions that we've had through the entire last year. Uh, across all the sessions that we've had with, and thanks, thankful for Charles Blonner, you know, who's our common mentor and also a great uh, contributor to the uh, to the work that we do at CFF, including our cyber board work, work and several other areas that we're working together. I mean, it's a common thread. You don't, you don't, you're probably not in the same room, but you could be, right? I mean, virtually, just because of what we have shared across each other. Um, I, I think uh, a couple of items that I would like to take away from this and also a call for action for the broader community is that uh, you know try to identify the real need and uh, your real um, current self as you can um, think about you know contributing and learning together it's it's always a two way process uh, each of us are lifelong you know or should be lifelong learners and that's when exactly when we make progress uh, you know, if, if um, I claim to go back to my 20 years in this career or Gordon in his 20 plus years, uh, I think we'll be bereft of, um, you know, the new and awesome that is coming. Um, I, I also related back to the experience, like, you know, when we go into school, uh, you know, 20, 25 years back, about we learned about C programming, C++ programming. Um, and, and that was a different orientation as an engineer. Um, if we go try to use that, I think will be terrible when we uh, kind of go into the AI and quantum led world. Uh, so think about newer levels of learning, newer uh, career pathways, newer functions that you may not have had the experience of, but can embrace uh, when it comes to different professions, uh, professional. Um, Kind of uh, position in cybersecurity. So whether you're in the industry, um, you know, as part of a cyber program, uh, which I think each of us have been in some way or former fashion, or you are on the service provider side, be it a technology service provider or a uh, you know uh, consulting professional services or, or people part, you have the opportunity to learn and grow and transition into. Uh, you know, a very interesting, um, uh, this, you know, kind of, um, I, I think I had a, uh, this weekend I was with my son at a robotics competition, met one of his, uh, you know, friend's parents, and uh, we just got to know each other. And he said that, uh, look, I just joined sales and my background is uh, infrastructure. And uh, I have been in the industry for, for about 20 years. And he just joined a product company as a sales leader. And so I can sleep a little bit better because, you know, my nights and weekends were on calls and all of that. 
now I'm actually having a little bit of better sleep because I know uh, people uh, know that I what I'll be selling has some credibility and and I put my own you know credentials behind it. Um, but I never thought sales was a career for me. I always was on the other side of the book. So I think think about those opportunities that you get, and it, it it's coming from a very seasoned uh, practitioner and professional in this space. Um, so. Uh, look at that uh, you know just don't box yourself into i want to be this particular uh, role because you may not know once you go to the other side what it is right you actually have to embrace that uh, uh, new opportunity with a open mind and and learn um, most of us who have built cyber security programs or have delivered uh, from the industry side uh, you know have done it with a certain amount of confidence because we have we have certain experience behind us but once you execute on this uh, you know on this you will learn that a business today most for the most part is run by technology and very much influenced whether it's a small company or a large is very much influenced by uh, you know different cyber cast of cybersecurity actors uh, could be nation state adversaries especially talking about cybersecurity parallels or could be an opportunistic attacker. So we have taken on the role and responsibility of defend, defending the business. But as we spoke through this last uh, you know, couple of hours and also some of the new announcements coming up, um, from defenders of business, we are starting to become builders of business. And I think that transition is also exciting. So if you are a seasoned leader listening to this, and if you are looking to transition, I mean, track some of those uh, CISOs who have gone on to become CIOs and CTOs. So uh, the, the CISO role may not be a terminal role for you, right? Um, so just, just don't be CISO chasers. Um, uh, as I always try to say, right, you know, my personal uh, orientation is I try to go behind the talent, not the title, because titles tend to change very frequently, especially in today's world. Um, but if you are behind a, you know, a, a good, talented person, uh, you will do yourself and the other person a lot more good. I also took away from uh, the skills and qualifications uh, discussion that uh, a lot of the uh, you know uh, skills qualifications that we came into the industry with are um, probably not relevant anymore. Just because uh, you know uh, we have been called upon to solve problems or lead or manage, right? But, whether solving problem as an engineer, if you learned it as an electrical engineer, which I am, I mean, if you could apply that, that would be the foundational uh, contribution you can make to business, solving problems. Uh, whereas if you're operating, somebody built a architecture or a program for you and an operating, you're on, you know, you are on the cybersecurity operations team or your cybersecurity program uh, team, then, you know, what you would be is making sure that you take upon, embrace upon the program that has been entrusted with, uh, to you and be able to operate it efficiently, making sure the key metrics and, and key indicators of success are all fed back to the management. And then managing a program uh, with the resources, budget, and all of that. It's not necessarily a cybersecurity skill. I mean, you definitely need some orientation in terms of how you run programs. And uh, that aligns to the management expectations. But not necessarily a cybersecurity function. It's a, it's a management function. And above all of this is leadership, right? So I think each of you are leaders in your own rights and roles. Uh, you have you have delivered programs with uh, with a sense of uh, you know ownership, and that leadership skill is something that you need to continue to build upon. If you just think about what you know the the, the uh, last comments that Nadia had in terms of learning to stand out and also uh, you know identifying the out, outstanding women who were in this uh, room full of men i think it was a, a courage you know moment of leadership and courage that was uh, you know called upon she called upon herself and and that doesn't come easy and i think that comes with this sense of uh, you know courage and also um, you know ownership of this problem that you want to solve and then that distinguishes yourself from others uh, not everybody can do that. Um, so skills and qualifications, please do not lim limit yourselves to the what you are learning in school, which is ex very important. But uh, you know that that kind of builds the foundation. But don't limit yourselves to the to your um, you know degrees. 
Um, a second is certification. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, you, Nadia bringing up the the, C, the IC Square CC certification. And, uh, you know, I, I think they have been well resourced. Uh, they are probably one of the largest organizations that actually pull for, for the 1 million call. And Claire has been part of these discussions prior to, uh, you know, this launch and all. Uh, I think that, the, you know, seek out those resources. There are plenty of them. And I think that's what has been floating around um, in social media across the different communities. Um, one very strong, um, you know, recommendation we have from the CFF leadership and community is that uh, don't just go navigating those resources yourself. Actually, look out and and search for uh, mentors. And that's exactly how most of you have articulated your experience have been. Do not feel, um, you know, do, do not feel this responsibility just your own, right? We are uh, we are collectively. Uh, a, a great community of mentors as much as we are, you know, individual learners and mentees. So please feel free to reach out to CFF, join CFF as a friend of CFF or even the broader communities that we are connected to. However, uh, you know, this is something Lynn and Gordon, and I think all of you kind of mentioned about the, the etiquette of the, those relationships are going to be extremely important. If you're just looking out to connect to someone, please do it with a professional courtesy and uh, and not with a you know an intent if you know express your intent if, if that is something that doesn't work for you i think most of us will say no right you know i'm not the right person or uh, I, I i i don't like people stonewalling i think that's uh, even i get very frustrated about that uh, don't just think that you being an entry level or career transitioner getting that reception all of us get that right if somebody is not interested um most of the times they will say no i'm not the right person or uh, uh, or want to learn more but it could very well be that you know they just don't want to. They just want the bandwidth, or the time. Uh, the best way I can uh, I can encourage you to take those kind of uh, uh, you know uh, I would say uh, ghosting is to know that people are busy. Okay, I mean if they are not interested, that doesn't always mean that uh, they're not interested in you. They just don't may not have the bandwidth, and we get that negative reception many a times. That's perfectly fine. Um, okay, it's not fine, but it, it and I think you should not feel that you have done something wrong unless you had your message was not well done. And I think that's where you need a little bit more coaching. That you know, what message should you intro yourself with? Uh, sometimes I just hit that connect button on LinkedIn, and 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 uh, but most of the times I think, okay, what could be meaningful message to this person I'm reaching out? Okay, then finally, networking, um, you know, and professional development. I think we we talked very thoroughly about it throughout the entire conversation. I'm really, um, you know, impressed with how intentional each of you have been. You know, at, at every level, like you know, starting from Gordon, who spent decades in this industry, he was a seasoned leader to those that have just joined and and contributed. I think networking and professional development is an essential, you know, process of your career, uh, of your personal life. Most of the folks that I work with, uh, you know, be it someone as, uh, you know, as well seasoned and um, and experienced and very well known prominent figures like, you know, I'll name names, Jim Ruth or we talk about Charles Blonner and several other uh, friends that I work with. Um, you know, we work on several things and items. And uh, most of the times I think we overlap because we have spent a lifetime together in, in working uh, in the industry. But um, uh, but most of the time, uh, you know, they will direct you to someone else, okay? And uh, they will direct you to someone who can probably be more immediately beneficial to you. And that's how uh, even the the networking goes, right? Uh, Nadia, if you recollect, in our cohorts, we had a mentor and we had uh, we had you know regular presenters, uh, and not everyone had the bandwidth to come and talk to us on a regular basis. In fact. Um, I, I jumped on Marine Allison. If you remember, our closing uh, session was when she mentioned one one thing that actually stuck with my head is that her winners were always the team B. If you remember, I mean that was uh, that was a very uh, profound statement she made that she didn't have always the winners. Uh, the 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 champions are the ones. Uh, her winning team was always the team B. And and I, you know I, I felt intrigued to go back to my teams that I worked with, and um, and that's that's where we saw people actually trying to prove themselves. So you don't necessarily have to stand on the top of the Olympic podium of cyber and and claim the gold medal, and then be do something. Okay, you can be 
the the person who ran you know second in the relay race but still be able to contribute to your program and and that is where you know longevity comes you know most of us have been successful in our career to whatever extent we have been is because we have had the endurance and the stamina to to kind of put up with the overall broad uh, asks that we have had or the aspirations that we have carried so think about two things one is that you should be able to contribute immediately to whatever extent you can to what you are currently capable of right that is called being a practitioner and um, putting into practice your knowledge and experience you are a professional and and if you think see our communications we we typically go it in three ways one is kind of entry level second thing is practitioner second the third one is professional and then leaders and executives right so start being a, 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 a you know in this practice of of this profession and learning as you work and as you work you get more work on your on your way that's typically how things work like you know 20% of the team actually carries 80% of the weight which is not fair but you know uh, we 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 have you know human beings are not all made equal so is the team it's always strength in in collective um strength not necessarily individual strength so i think you know it's better to be a champion team uh, you know a, a team b versus then a you know uh, we're running for the champion then and when we are all for underdogs so if you need help let us know uh, there's no dearth of motivation there um second one is um, in terms of professional development uh, and and your aspirations think about leaning on some of the folks that you see here and we'll have subsequent discussions as well um join some of these forums and there are call for cohorts uh, this is also probably the right time to uh, talk about our summer research program we we, we have been doing a rolling in uh, you know intake of different um, candidates um earlier we used to just as i think catherine mentioned already about that right we do have uh, we were you know limiting ourselves by not in, including uh, high school students and also we have had a tremendous experience last couple of years with high school students as much as with graduate and undergrad so uh, so this summer research program is is an evolution of our internship program uh, which basically puts all of you together with with uh, with um, candidates at every level so uh we are still in a rolling entry of our summer interns and fellowships and fellows so please uh, uh you know feel free to reach out catherine has the details she will she will be able to plug you in um but overall i think uh, this discussion has been extremely robust i know you have stayed uh, you know longer than probably due uh, beyond the work hours as much as uh, you know we heard each of your own um, kind of uh, challenges and personal struggles to get to where you are and also you know life is not you know done until it's done so there is so much to do beyond what we uh, can or are doing or called upon to do now uh, you know this project gateway uh, hopefully is the gateway to that uh, that talent uh, development and cyber capacity at at every level um, uh, what i would uh, like to close this discussion with is uh, that each of you and your contribution is is extremely you know um, extremely important and incredible in terms of your sharing your personal knowledge and skills uh, uh hopefully you know we are not asking too much when we say you know if, uh, if there are mentees and interns coming up through this um process in the summer uh, hopefully each of you can give a little bit of time um i know precious time to to guide them and if you need and i think you need as much as i need uh, mentors please feel free to tap on this uh, you know amazing community uh for your growth uh, and uh, we we try to formalize things so that you know we can operationally predict like and track and and support those operations um uh, however you know we have a, we have a very personal and loosely gathered organization so uh, feel free to take advantage of that um we are many of us are going to be at rsa so for those those that are going we are going to have uh, you know entire four days there um so please feel free to reach out to catherine again and or or go to our website and register uh we will have many opportunities to connect for those that are not able to go please don't think you're missing out anything you know it's going to be a, a, another opportunity for us uh, and subsequent opportunities to come and meet you whether uh, you know virtually or together and in person so uh, with that uh, I, i'd call for any few closing comments i know you have had a long lengthy discussion uh, you know uh, starting with lin I, i see you in a certain order in my in my screen so i'll just call upon you for any closing comments that you may have sure 
Uh, well, thank you so much, Val and and uh, CFF for organizing this. My my really my final thoughts for for everyone is most of the skills we talked about today. I mean, yes, they're specific cyber ones, but they are life skills, and they'll serve you well um, whether you come into cyber at early career, mid, or like people like myself intentionally because this is really calling you with a purpose. The most important thing I I learned I think in life at this point is. Your network is your net worth. I don't know who to attribute that quote to, but it is so true. And I, I think earlier I, I talked about some of the books that have that I have learned from, books like Never Read Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. Um, there's, there's many others on networking. There's uh, others for upskilling on business skills and human skills. So don't discount your bookshelf. And, and the great things that, you, yes, we do a lot of webinars and we do things like that, but uh, I, I found great value in, in building a good business and learning library of my own and, um, and sharing that with others. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Nadia, how about uh, a few words from you to close up? Thanks, Val. I think because I used so many of my words earlier, I'm going to use a little bit less now. <laughs> um, I'd like to actually say something that I, um, that Lynn has spoken so many times about is sales, right? We are all in sales. Everybody's in sales. I learned this. Um, you sell yourself, firstly. You need to learn how to sell yourself, and you'll be confident enough that one day when you walk into the boardroom, because you're going to have to sell your strategy, because that is key, right? You have to look for budget. You have to speak to the CFO. You have to make sure that there's money. So you're selling all the time. And I learned that. It was a hard lesson to learn. Um, so we all in sales learn, and I love it, because you're right. It's a fundamental skill that you need to have. Um, but also, um, you're never alone, right? There's um, I know cyber sounds like this really cool exclusive club that everybody can't get into, but it's not. It's really not like that. I just think, um, you know, have passion, have drive, re reach out, um, speak to people and network, network, network. I think all of us have said it so many times. Join groups. Um, there's a couple of groups that I also want to talk about quickly and I forgot to mention it was uh, for diversity, cyberversity or cyversity, diversity cyber council and secure diversity and i know a lot of them are, are based in the us so i know a lot of people will benefit from that if there's anybody in africa or south africa that looks for something specific please reach out to me and i'll share those with you as well but thank you so much val and um catherine and cff for having me especially from uh here deep down south africa <laughs> i appreciate it a lot and nice meeting all of you guys it was such a pleasure being on the on the panel with you all Thank you, Nadia. Leah Gordon, anything close to uh, to close this? Yeah, I'll reiterate a little bit what Lynn and Nadia said, but you know, always be building your network. Um, that's very, very important. Hone in on your skills and always be learning. Um, and I want to thank CFF and this organization and all of you today, and um, you know, here to help for anybody who needs it. So please do reach out. Yeah, Val, I'll just add, um, you know, there's um, four and a half million jobs open in cybersecurity right now globally. There's somewhere between, depending on what you read, 350 and 450,000 jobs open in the U.S. So there is a place for everyone in, in cybersecurity. Um, my son works in cybersecurity uh, in sales, and uh, his background is a degree in education, of all things. Um, so absolutely, uh, we need salespeople, we need marketing people. Um, we've done a terrible job of marketing um, this industry um, and we need to attract more people. So um, if you're interested, reach out. Um, any of us would be happy to help. So thank you, Val. Thank you, Catherine. Excellent. Thank you, co-panelists. Uh, this was, I think was excellent. Thank you so much, and uh, you know, uh, with that, uh, I'll give the uh, you know session back to everyone. Take care. Uh, we'll stay in touch and let us know if you need any help. Uh, you can go to www.cyberfuturefoundation.org and uh, find us or join us on LinkedIn. 
uh, you know, always there to help and support uh, the journey of those looking for a career in service. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.